This is part two of five covering proof that God exists. His existence need not be taken on faith. Despite widespread controversy, you can know with absolute certainty that an all-intelligent mind created the universe and all life on earth. Part one brought evidence from astronomy, biology, chemistry, and mathematics. Now comes even more stunning, yet largely little-known, proofs. Some lengthy quotes will appear, but they are all worth the time taken because after completing this series, your belief in God will stand on bedrock. Let's now journey deep into the cells of all living organisms. This will be unlike any trip you have ever taken. There appears a world of such exquisite detail, design, complexity, interdependence, and specificity as to boggle the mind. Let's start painting. A brief discussion of proteins and sequencing is necessary. To form a protein, amino acids must link together to form a chain. Amino acids form functioning proteins only when they adopt very specific sequential arrangements like properly sequenced letters in an English sentence. Thus, amino acids alone do not make proteins any more than letters alone make poetry. In both cases, the sequencing of the constituent parts determines the function of the whole. Explaining the origin of the specific sequencing of proteins and DNA lies at the heart of the current crisis in materialistic evolutionary thinking. With evolution now established as the foundation of modern biology supported by the entire global scientific community, with Christianity in a state of decline and intelligent design disproved in a court of law with no defense among scholars, it is amusing that you still pretend that evolution is somehow in crisis and not your own baseless assertions of myths and magic. In each of these videos so far, I've cited prominent scientists specializing in each of the relevant fields who directly refuted the claims you were making. Since you're now citing Stephen Meyer of the creationist propaganda mill known as the Discovery Institute, then my counter citation will be Dr. P.Z. Myers. He's a professor of developmental biology who has repeatedly disproved the claims made by Stephen Meyer as well as those of other Discovery Institute fellows, not just in the peer-reviewed literature, but also as a matter of public spectacle. I happened to see this presentation live, so it stuck in my memory. PZ confirmed that the human genome has only 20,000 genes amongst 3 billion base pairs in total. We have much fewer genes than many simple life forms, including roundworms and rice. He said that only 1.5% of our genome is coding DNA, while another 3% is regulatory. If we include all other categories of functional DNA, including ribosomal, transfer, and microRNA genes, it still only amounts to 5% of the total genome. He then explained how another 10% is essentially random gibberish created by a buggy enzymatic process, another indication of unintelligent design. 21% uh, of the genome is parasitic viral copies and 13% is just copies of copies. 8% of the genome is made by endogenous retroviruses. And remember, that's when a virus inserts its DNA into a gamete cell, which is then inherited by all the descendants of that organism. Remember also that Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute said that the human genome did not have any preponderance of junk. Instead, he said it was dominated by functional DNA. But the fact is that only 5% of our genome is functional DNA. 10% is structural DNA, and 45% is known to be useless parasitic DNA. The remaining 40% PZ described as job security for molecular biologists because it isn't all yet understood. But he added that some of that is already known to be pseudogenes dysfunctional garbage that are like defunct genes, just what you'd expect of unintended blind design. Science works by making testable and potentially falsifiable hypotheses, meaning that there has to be some way to tell if the postulation is wrong. You can never make sure that you've got everything exactly right, and even if you are right, there still may be some degree of error somewhere. If you think you've got the absolute proof of the absolute truth, then you're probably wrong unless you really know what you're talking about. You can't always prove it right, or can't always prove it completely right, but you can always prove it wrong, in whole or in part. You have to devise a falsifiable hypothesis because the goal of science is to improve understanding, and the only way to do that is to seek out the flaws in your current perception and correct them. You can't do that if you refuse to admit that you even could be wrong. So you make a hypothesis. If the postulation is true, then we should expect that certain associated or 
dependent possibility should be true also. But if this is true, then this other possibility should not be true because that would be inconsistent. And once you have your hypothesis and some way to possibly disprove it, then you devise an experiment to test it. And this is where evolution has never failed and where creationism has never succeeded. It has always failed every time. Now, if you're testing for an imperceptible, undetectable god who might be arbitrarily monkeying with the physics in order to fool you to remain hidden, that is an unfalsifiable and therefore useless hypothesis. If it's not indicated by any indicative evidence either, then you've already failed before you've begun. So William Dembski of the Discovery Institute made the mistake of proposing a falsifiable hypothesis. He said that on an evolutionary view, we expect a lot of useless DNA. If, on the other hand, organisms are designed, we expect DNA as much as possible to exhibit function. P.C. Myers had clearly shown that the first prediction was correct and the latter was not, thus disproving creationism. With no intelligent designer evidently involved, natural selection weeds out detrimental mutations and selects for beneficial mutations, but the neutral ones, having neither cost nor ill effect, may freely accumulate as junk. PZ and other scientists also commented that vast sections of DNA had been removed from test animals without any apparent effect. This proves that Stephen Meyer and the other creationists at the Discovery Institute are as wrong as it is possible to be. Proteins must appear in exact sequences to cause specific chemical reactions or build specific structures within the cells. This action is called specificity. It is because of specificity that proteins cannot substitute for one another. They are as different in purpose as an axe, drill, hammer, or screwdriver. There are plenty of cases where multiple enzymes do overlap in function, where two proteins share the same function. For example, there are three alkaline phosphatases in humans, each expressed in varying amounts at different tissues at different times. They all do essentially the same job at different rates or specificities. Also, many genes exist in multiple copies, called paralogous genes. There are also cases where a single enzyme is multifunctional, meaning that one protein has two or more functions. For example, the human immunodeficiency virus is a tiny little protein called VPR that does at least four jobs during the virus life cycle. So they can be substituted. You can even take Hox genes from mice and put them into fruit flies and they do the correct job in the fruit fly. This is another example of common ancestry rather than a common designer. Let's summarize the enormous difficulty of believing DNA happened by chance. The complexity and intricacy of the DNA molecule, combined with the staggering amount of chemically coded information it contains, speaks unerringly to the fact that this super molecule simply could not have happened by blind chance. It is not possible for a code of any kind to arise by chance or accident. A code is the work of an intelligent mind. Even the cleverest dog or chimpanzee could not work out a code of any kind. It is obvious then that chance cannot do it. This could no more have been the work of chance or accident than could the Moonlight Sonata be played by mice running up and down the keyboard of my piano. Codes do not arise from chaos. But we're not talking about chaos, are we? At least not chaos as you would imagine it. We're talking about properties of emergent complexity arising from an inherently ordered system. We'll talk more about emergence in a later video. For the moment, I'll call your attention to Benoit Mendelbrandt, inventor of the fractal. He said that infinite complexity can spring from a system that is based on a few simple rules. Remember what I said in a previous video? That most of the time, whenever creation scientists have actual degrees, they tend to comment on fields that are unrelated to their training. For example, your source, E.H. Andrews, is an engineer, like Mendelbrandt. But we're talking about genetics, aren't we? I'm not a geneticist either, but I do know a couple, including my friend Concordance, who is a regular co-host on the Magic Sandwich Show podcast. He and I argue that DNA is not a code in the sense that you're using, where words or letters are only symbols substituted to mean something else. The letters in DNA aren't actual letters. They're abbreviations of the chemical components. So DNA is more like a computer code, where we're not substituting symbols conveying a message to be interpreted by someone else. These aren't just the coded commands either. These are the physical components that actually do stuff. DNA is a material three-dimensional molecule causing chemical reactions. So it isn't like any code ever produced by any known intelligence. It's not the only autocatalytic self-replicating molecule either. There are others, including RNA. And this gets to your contention about DNA originating by chance. 
I made a classroom supplement science video to explain this to eighth graders, and as we've established in a previous video, your knowledge of science is almost at that level. So I'll play you a clip. With that established, scientists then had to show how the most important ingredient came about, the extremely complex macromolecule known as DNA. There's another version of genetics called RNA, and activated RNA actually builds DNA. Some viruses don't have DNA, but they do have RNA, and this led many scientists to hypothesize life beginning in an RNA world. RNA and DNA are both made of many times repeated components called nucleotides. It took a while, but researchers have shown how RNA nucleotides could have formed naturally in conditions now expected of the prebiotic Earth. In 2009, organic chemist John Sutherland at the University of Manchester showed how a specific cocktail of relatively simple chemicals became increasingly complex after several cycles of repeated inundation, dehydration, and irradiation. Once the mix became sufficiently complex, after enough repetition, a plausible phosphate was introduced, and the mix spontaneously transformed into ribonucleotides the precursor of nucleic acids, the building blocks of RNA and DNA. Dr. Sutherland remarked that his laboratory conditions were like the warm little pond which Darwin speculated might be how life first emerged, provided that pond evaporated, got heated, and then it rained, and then the sun shone. Interestingly, the pathway from simple chemistry to complex chemistry to basic biology involves multiple mediums repeatedly heating and cooling, dousing and drying. This is generally expected to be in solution, optimally uh, near underwater geothermal vents or in volcanic pools near a shoreline. Other scientists had already shown that by dripping solutions of amino acids or RNA nucleotides onto a particular type of clay, it produced polymers, nucleotide precursors spontaneously assembled into RNA strands, even without the help of enzymes or ribosomes. Another team of researchers at Harvard showed how RNA could even duplicate itself without the normally necessary enzyme. An enzyme is a catalytic molecule which reacts to other molecules performing certain functions. They can metabolize food and digestion, or they can help rapidly replicate macromolecules, or make new copies of RNA. In fact, the enzyme itself is actually made of RNA. When double-stranded RNA is heated and divides, one strand contorts into a ribosome and the other becomes a template to be copied. Within the field of abiogenesis research, also known as prebiotic chemistry, there are literally dozens of concordant hypotheses, almost all of which could be true at the same time. Scientists have even composed protocells with some degree of metabolic processes, something similar to the hypothesized hypercycle. So it seems like the whole hypothesis has already been substantiated but not quite yet. What we have established so far is that yes, all of this really can happen by accident, or as you would put it, by chance. Now another source. Atheist Richard Dawkins has admitted, the more statistically improbable a thing is, the less we can believe it just happened by blind chance. Superficially, the obvious alternative to chance is an intelligent designer. The source book later states, that is the very point the theist is stressing. An intelligent designer is demanded by the available evidence. Finally, you've cited a creationist with an actual degree relevant to the subject he's talking about. Bert Thompson has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a doctorate in Microbiology. Too bad he's an apologist, which means that he has to suspend what he knows about science to defend his interpretation of scripture regardless. Well, he's not an apologist anymore. He was the director of Apologetics Press until he was fired amid multiple accusations of sexual misconduct with young boys. But that's not why he's wrong. He's wrong for the same reason you are. Because the argument from incredulity is a logical fallacy. It is not evidence of anything but your own lack of logic. As I understand it, evidence is a body of verifiably accurate facts which are positively indicative of or exclusively concordant with only one available option over any other. And there is not even one fact which meets any of those criteria in support of a god. Remember what Dawkins said, that an intelligent designer was only superficially the most obvious option. In fact, that option has not even been shown to be an option as it was never indicated by any actual fact. The famous Dr. Carl Sagan wrote about DNA. The information content of a simple cell has been estimated as around 10 to the 12th power, or 1 trillion bits. 
he put this number into perspective. That if one were to count every letter of every word of every book in the world's largest library, over 10 million volumes, the final tally would be approximately a trillion letters. Thus, a single cell contains the equivalent information content of more than 10 million volumes. No disrespect to the venerable Carl Sagan, but this article was written for the Encyclopedia Britannica way back in 1974, a quarter century before the first genome had been completely mapped. Whatever his source then, it was even older than that and obviously outdated. It needs to be updated, and again, I'd rather not hear about genetics from an astronomer, even a great astronomer, so let's hear from someone who studies genetics. Hi, my name's Crystal. I graduated from Texas A&M University with a degree in Agricultural Leadership and Development with emphasis in genetics and biochemistry. I also researched in several labs on campus in genetics. And today I'm going to talk about some very interesting facts about genetics that you probably don't know. Now, you probably think that the human genome size is rather large, which it is because we are a very complex mammal. In fact, it will fill up 90 volumes of an Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, why don't we compare that to something else? Let's say a lily seed. A lily seed actually is bigger than our genome. Its genome would fill up 1,800 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, we normally think that the human genome is this huge, vast information. Uh, but actually, if we convert it into binary code, the human genome is just slightly larger than that of the storage capacity of a CD-ROM. As a matter of fact, Windows XP is twice as large as our human genome. So the human genome actually requires 750 megabytes of storage, whereas Windows XP would require 1,500 megabytes of storage. So as you can see, Windows XP actually requires twice the storage as the human genome. In computer terms, the human genome is stored in 6-bit combinations of information. The PlayStation 3 is 128 bits. Nothing works unless everything works at the same time. DNA could not have gradually come into existence. Special creation is required, required for DNA to exist. By special creation, you're talking about a creative miracle. Remember that a miracle is the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways which are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of nature. This is the same definition as magic. So you are literally saying that it had to be poofed out of nothing by magic. Magical miracles or miraculous magic are never required for anything in reality. As we've already seen, DNA is created by RNA, and RNA really can spontaneously create itself given the right sequence of normal, natural, prior conditions. Now, this is all new information. Ten years ago, we didn't know this, and special creation wasn't required then either, because there is never a point where scientists can just throw up their hands and say, I don't know how it works, so it must be magic. And if they had said that back then, they would have been wrong today. And if they say it today, they'll be wrong ten years from now. So you can't do it. And the only way to know what you know is to test what you think you know and make sure it works. Do you know it, or do you only believe that you do? So all hypotheses have to be testable. That means they necessarily have to be natural because you can't test the supernatural. I mean, if it were real, you could. The things you see on Star Trek or Star Wars, Lord of the Rings and so on, people would be able to do that in real life too. And then you would be able to test the supernatural with reliable results. But since we can only do that in fictional fantasies, then here in the real world we have to limit hypotheses to things that are indicated by actual factual evidence that we can test. In which case, evolution has survived every test applied by the greatest minds of our time, while creationism can't survive any scrutiny at all. <laughs>